Hello and welcome to the Swim Brief. I'm Chris DeSantis. I realize I never say my name. Do I ever introduce myself at the beginning of this podcast, Eric? Or do I just go straight to the introductions of the guests? I've, I think it's just welcome to the podcast and then here's me making fun of Joel about something again. Um, yeah. And then again, and then again, and then again. Right. Um, which he still seems to be out trying to source that quinoa for his granola well, recipe. Um, actually, last time I heard from him, he was uh, traveling to Japan with to meet with some scientists from the University of Tokyo. Unfortunately, all foreign nationals are currently banned from entering Japan. So he's been um, stuck in a hotel quarantine in, uh, in Tokyo um and uh i guess he's going to be flying back at some point but we just don't know you know the status and we hope of course that uh joel can have a good christmas just like everybody else um but you know these there's situations beyond our control um luckily you're still here eric wyken uh, from, from milwaukee are you back in milwaukee i am you look I look like I you're in your childhood bedroom or something. No, it's, well, it is a spare bedroom. There does happen to be some kind of stuff that my mom put up to signify <laughs> that it is, in fact, the holidays. Right. Um, this is my little camp out. And for those of you watching the YouTube, I have my sweatshirt on because I am in an addition on the house that this room was built on. So there is some heat, but <laughs> it is a little bit colder than the rest of the house. So, um, yeah. There's no obscure t-shirt today. There's just my Aww. sweatshirt to keep me warm. Um, but well, I put on a matching quarter zip, black quarter zip, so that we could be, <laughs> <laughs> that we could yes, be twins yes, we're today. Gonna nerd it out and match. Yeah. Uh, no, but it's good. I'm up here for about almost two weeks, and then I head back to see some friends in Nebraska um, and just kind of get away from Texas for a bit. And then I decided to fly to a place that's probably... 40 to 50 degrees cooler on average yeah. so i'm not sure Perfect. I'm enjoying that decision aspect of it but everything I, other than that is good so like i said i don't understand why anyone would willingly spend time in the state of wisconsin but to each their own do you know what i mean um we got some uh big topics to discuss today we're going to talk about where in the world is coley stickles we're going to talk about What's going on with uh, Taylor Ruck or what has been going on with Taylor Ruck? She made a big admission this week. And then, as I told you ominously before we started recording, um, I have a special game for us to play at the end. So I'm going to surprise. The thing, the thing everyone listening should know about Eric is he loves surprises. And I, as his friend, love to surprise him then because <laughs> it's... Uh, you know, I just want him Ugh. to feel fulfilled in our relationship. So I made a surprise like game to get him. And Chris loves making sure that I'm unprepared about things. So those of you who are not on these calls before we actually go live, I'm trying to get some kind of direction for certain topics. And Chris's response 100 times out of 100 is either sure or okay. And here I am like, not having any idea. So riffing on certain things in my life, not a problem. Try to make sure I don't look like a fool on a podcast that seven people listen to. For some reason, I have issue with. So there's way more than seven people. There's at least eight or nine. Okay, That's sorry. I didn't higher. know you're. Uh, yeah, I didn't know you roped your wife into listening to this on road trips. So well, no, okay, I guess to it be, is eight or nine. <laughs> to be fair, I got her to just subscribe to it. She doesn't actually listen to it, but at least you know, sort of pumps up my stats. By downloading yeah, to her phone. Baby. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, hopefully it'll recommend it to a few more um, professional women. Because I think this is actually, at its heart, this is a podcast for professional women who want to get ahead and want to have it all. This is the podcast for them. All right. Speaking of professional women. Not sure what they're, yeah. <laughs> speaking of professional women, <laughs> Beryl Gosteldello. She's a professional swimmer and um she's gonna go to frisco texas which is to me sounds like a made-up place i if you had told me that that was a fictional town um up until today i would have totally bought it but apparently it's a real place in texas and coley stickles who i can't seem people who have been listening to this podcast know that he was in 
Nebraska. He was back in Nebraska, his home state. Then he was out in Flagstaff, Arizona. And now apparently he's in Texas. Eric, you seem to know slightly more about what the heck is going on than me. So please enlighten us. What is what yeah, is going on? So for those of you who don't know where Frisco is, it is a northern suburb of Dallas. Okay. For those of you who don't know what Texas swimming looks like, it's a lot like Texas football. So um, school district will build a natatorium for anywhere from five to eight high schools to use. So in any given major city, there are a number of 50 meter natatoriums around. And it just so happens that in Frisco, they have a relatively new natatorium, uh, 50 meter tank. In Dallas, off the top of my head, there's at least six 50 meter, 50 meter natatoriums that are associated with school districts in some way, shape or form. So there is definitely some big water up in that area. So as far as having opportunities for local long course meets to kind of test how things are going. She's definitely in a great place. Um, in that interview on Swim Swim alluded to Coley being in Frisco. We don't have any visual evidence yet uh, of Coley being in, in the area, but it, it just seems like the, the, the reality is that she's moved from College Station to Frisco, Texas, which is about a two and a half hour drive. So uh, if she needs to get uh, away from Frisco, if it's just going to be Coley and her, or if Diaceto is actually going to bounce up to Frisco for a bit. If you really enjoyed his time with, with Coley, we don't really know for sure. And in, in terms of where in the United States is Seto, they kind of have their own parallel things, Coley and, and Seto, and they're just kind of yeah. seeing where they go. Um, but in any event, she's got, if she's got access to that natatorium, it's a really great spot to be. Uh, just pulling up some of the the, the images that I could of that natatorium, the air circulation system is a lot like a natatorium near me in the woodlands. So the air quality for her facility she's going to be in is going to be good as well. So for those of you who have to deal with natatoriums or just six lane high school pools, sometimes the air quality is terrible. She's not going to run into that issue. And it's a big hub. Um, she's a tier athlete. I know tier has representation inside the city itself. So she's got a, a, a a lot of things going for her uh, locally. And then obviously just besides being Dallas, be a major metropolitan area, access to a lot of other things outside of that is really good. So curious to see uh, what happens. I know Chris, I'm going to let you chime in on some more of the, 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 dam the dynamic that is going to be Farrell and, and Coley. So. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I just, uh, I think the thing that I'm thinking of when I look at this story is first off um, I think a lot of a lot of us, myself probably, somewhat included, were uh, burying Coley when he got fired from University of Alabama. Um, I'm putting that in with uh, I didn't do the scare quotes while I said it, but but my voice indicated the scare quotes. Um, so, you know, to to find that on the other end of this, um, Coley still has a lot of credibility with um, professional caliber swimmers, Gasoldello, Diasetto, who you mentioned. Um, it seems like he, I don't know how the heck he's going to continue to make a living off this kind of stuff. Maybe I should call him up and ask him, um, get him on this podcast to explain what the heck is going on because um, I just find myself very curious about the whole thing. And I wonder, um, if this is sort of Coley trying to blaze a new trail in terms of like being a basically a pro swim coach without being attached to an existent club team or a college program, right? Because yeah. even if you look at the people like, you know, Dave Marsh is probably the best example in the last 10 years of sort of running pro swimming groups. Um, he's always been attached to something. Uh, in order to do that. There's always been some more sort of existing swimming structure. And this seems to be operating wholly independent of those things. So um, in that sense, it's very innovative and um, Coley is nothing if not innovative. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just be really interested. Um, you know, I, as far as the dynamic between the two of them, 
I, I'm not sure it matters um, in so much as uh, Gastaldello, you know, thinks that this is the right coach for her to have, and he's interested in coaching her, you know. Um, and uh, obviously, she feels good about um, what kind of results she's going to be able to produce um, doing this. And um, I'll be really curious to see how it follows yeah, from here. Yeah, yeah. She alluded to that in in the interview. Um, people referencing her to Coley, and then her having a conversation, and she talked about just the the way in which she operates in terms of kind of a no nonsense just it's 100 percent honesty all the time which um just based upon my experience in, in working and talking to coley that's exactly what she's going to get um yeah. which at this point in her career she's really really goal oriented in reaching the apex she doesn't have time for anything else and right. and in that sense it's going to work it has potential to work really to well for for her and then you look at when you talked about, you know, Coley blazing this trail and, and he looked at, and I, I do recall maybe um, Brett Hawk having somewhat of a similar relationship with uh, Santos, uh, Nick Santos and how he's training on his own and his wife is kind of, is more or less his on-site coach and running it. And we, you know, we, the last time we talked, I talked about, you know, Lizette kind of doing his own thing. There are certainly people who it's like they're an individual she's really in she's not she's from france she's not you know so she's she really is in a land by herself she's gonna be training by herself focusing on her on her individual goals and then working within the system of france to get on relays and stuff like that and we all know you don't necessarily have to train every day with your relay mates to be a successful right. relay team you know it happens every four years so um I guess he's, you know, he's, he's finding a niche and this is certainly an opportunity for him to showcase that and have somebody who is the kind of dynamic athlete that's going to be able to flourish in his, um, in his style of coaching and, and, and practice writing. So I'm looking forward to it. I, I really want to see this experiment happen. And it's just so happened that I live three hours away from it. So maybe I'll be able to see a bit more of it. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we'll send you. I mean, you know, yeah, on your own with my, my with the travel budget that you on your own expense, me, right? We'll send you yeah. up there yeah. to figure out what's going on. Um, all right, let's shift topics to talk about uh, Taylor Ruck. Now, I think you know, just in a pure swimming context, I think one of the things that's important in this story is, you know, if you're just like sort of a, a swimming fan as we are, um, following things and. You've been following Stanford, you've been following international swimming, you're a Canadian swimming fan, right? You've probably at some point sat down and gone in the last few years, gone like, man, why is Taylor Ruck struggling so much? You know what I mean? There's a very, very promising athlete, somebody who's achieved at a really high level and has just had a tough few years. Um, and I think um, a lot of people were, were thinking, you know, she didn't swim up to her potential in the Olympics. And um, she's come out in the last few days and uh, spoken openly about the fact that um, during this time period, she developed an eating disorder um, that <clears throat> at a certain point, she sort of became, <clears throat> sorry, um, obsessive about uh, keeping sort of her body as skinny as possible. Um, and that uh, she did so um, that, that, you know, it started with sort of a, a really strict control over what she was eating. And eventually that strict control led her to some binging and then feeling bad about the binging led to some purging. Um, and in essence, I think uh, we have a great description of an eating disorder and how you can um, get there. I'm sure, you know, with all, as with all these things, what, what I think about is that um, a lot of this can be an extension of a, a practice you might do to be elite in sport. I mean, you know, on our team, we have a nutritionist that's making um, meal plans for athletes. So 
you know, I think uh, certainly at that high level, there's a lot of thought going into like, hey, how do you fuel your body and how do you sort of get, you know, optimize everything with nutrition? Um, and it's not that far from something that's sort of really healthy and really optimal to get into a zone where you've, you've gone past the point of healthy into something that's deeply unhealthy for you. Um, and I thought, uh, you know, um, she, she did a good job sort of, I think, talking about some of the environmental factors that um, led her to doing it without casting too much blame. Um, you know, I think everybody wants to uh, probably find somebody who said something overly critical or overly mean that sort of set these things in motion. We like that kind of plot. Um, but it seems like, at least from the way she's describing it, that um, it was sort of something that got most of its momentum internally. And she didn't realize she was doing it or exactly what it was until she talked to another person about it. I don't know. I've, I've gone on here for a while. Eric, what was your reaction uh, reading it? No, I think it's, you know, you, you never want to hear it. But at the same time, at least it's, there's an answer to it. You know, so you talked about whether or not why she's struggling for a while. Forgotten that she was even swimming still, right? Because it was just kind of this disappearance of going from Stanford and then back to Canada and, and training at some of their centers and in the situation that she had up there, um, you know, definitely feel sorry for the situation that she's in and the stuff that, that arises. And it doesn't surprise me given the level of expectation placed on herself, placed on her by the, the NGV for success and not necessarily overly. It's just, it's a yeah. culmination of what she's doing and internally and, and, and talking about overhearing offhand remarks, you know, in this, as, as it's quoted about coaches saying this or that, and it's like, you know, for all we know, the context of those conversations are offhand in the sense that just taking that information that may have been said or given offhand and then running with it in a, in a negative way. It, it's just the interpretation of somebody's words and, and if it is the case when, when coaches for some reason or whatever have these conversations, um, which they are important at an elite level, you do have this finite amount of, of, of range as many athlete, elite athletes talk about that within a few pounds of where they normally are within the water, they can certainly see and feel a difference. Um, and, and coaches have to be cognizant of it. But if you're having these conversations as a coach in earshot of any other athlete, you are an idiot. Like, it's just, there's, there's no, there's no, there's no way to get around it. If you're having there's nothing to be gained, there's else. nothing to be gained by discussing yeah. the body of somebody you're coaching. Yeah. Honestly, with, with anybody else, unless it's with a nutritionist that they're working with when it's like, Hey, I'm a little concerned about X, Y, Z. Like they right. seem to be trending in a path that is potentially unhealthy. And then that's where the nutritionist or the dietitian who has that experience can have that dialogue with them. So mm -hmm. yeah, you really, like you said, you're, it really doesn't make any, it doesn't do anybody good to kind of have these conversations. And I've heard these conversations. I've heard coaches make these yeah. comments offhand and, and just in the general space of other athletes. And it's just like, shut your damn mouth and, and, and leave that to the, the people who need to worry about it, which is, you know, you, right. the athlete and they're the dietitian and, and, and keep it, keep your trap shut um, when it comes to that stuff. And, and getting back to it, I'm glad, I'm glad she has an answer. She has a path that she's going to get back on and, and hopefully it's going to lead to the kind of success that she knows she has potential for. So, um, and then again, we've, we've seen this with others where it's like, she's putting this out there in public. This is going to help so many kids, you know, especially in Canadian swimming where, you know, they have had a lot of really great fast women. The guys are, are, are getting there. They have their, the, the national team has a little bit more work to do on that end, but just they need to know that these perfect people 
are are, are perfect. And, yeah, uh, it's it's okay to to handle these struggles and, and and reach out for help. So, well, I thought there was one piece of it. You remind me of one piece of it that I think is so valuable um, from the perspective of like dealing with uh, or coaching, you know, swimmers at the high school level and then beyond that. Because it's something I saw as a college coach over and over and over again. And she was talking about how, you know, essentially if I could just, I was trying to just keep my body like it was when I was, you know, 15, 16 years old. And I think this happens for a lot of female swimmers that they have this big peak right around that age, right around at that sort of end of puberty age of swimming. And then, um, or sort of just maybe even pre-puberty and, um, it sort of cements in their mind, like, that's why I swam fast because my body looked like that. And we just have a complete dearth and I'm the wrong messenger for it. So it's not like I'm volunteering to deliver the message, but I think we have a complete, we need somebody with authority out there, probably preferably a woman, um, to be given out educational information on like what changes should you expect in your swimming when you go through puberty and beyond when you become a woman because your body will change right and yeah. um there will be in essence a new path forward for you and there's no like there's no there, there's nothing to be gained from trying to put yourself back in that sort of right post-puberty or pre-pubescent state. It doesn't work like that. Bodies don't do that. Um, and I just see like over and over and over again that nobody's talking to young girls in the sport at all about what's, what puberty is going to bring for them and beyond. And so they're just sort of left to figure it out from themselves. And quite often what they figure out on, their, on themselves is not good. Um, all right, before we get to the last topic, you had a couple loose ends you wanted to tie up from short course worlds. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to let you do that. And then I'll try to, you know, I'll jump in and respond where I feel inspired. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I now having a little bit more as my, as my year winds down with speedo and, and having traveled the last couple of weeks, it was a little bit difficult to try to stay on top of um, swim news also with, struggling with a non COVID cold. It just was like a mess. So being able to kind of follow short course worlds a little bit more and, and do a better job than I did with, um, short course Europeans, I was, I was really happy to see some of the people have success of the way that they did, you know, in, in seeing some of our, our young up and coming athletes have the swims that they did. Um, Ryan Held starting to you know bounce back from from his trials and, and really have some some standout swims. He's now down at ASU with Sun Devils and their yeah. pros, and it seems that transition seems to be working pretty well for him right now. Um, this could really be a great like we talked about. This could be a really great opportunity for Shane Casas to get it sorted out and, and be on the right path, um, having success at this meet, you know, regardless of who was there, he was at short course world championships and stepping up in finals and having good swims and posting best times. And, and that bodes really well for the future of um, US's backstroke group, uh, as obviously at some point, you know, Ryan Murphy is going to step away from, from swimming at, at the national level. So, you know, Kassas has two and a half years to really shore up and, and he's got a chance here with, with long course world championship trials in April um, coming through. It'd be interesting to see what happens with uh, Carson Foster. He had a good meet. I don't know if any of us expected more, I guess, you know, with, with how his, how his fall has gone so far, maybe he didn't do any resting at all. Just shaved and put on a fast suit and, and busted out the times he did. Um, and a couple of other things, I guess was one was seeing the relays at the end of these sessions at the end of the meet and then the athletes still being able to post really good times. I know there was one of the articles, the last one talking about um, the women's four by one medley. And there was a comment about whether or not 
um, Clara Kurzan would hit her fly split or was just off her fly split. And she went 55 six <laughs> and she had four swims that session. And I look at that race and it's like, oh, it'd have been nice to see him win gold. But then you look at each and every one of those individual swims and the same on the guy side too. You couldn't really ask for much more. Like they, they yeah. swam great. They just didn't happen to have the greatest of great swims. So it was nice to see them perform at a quote unquote acceptable level at the end of the meet. They performed, they did what they did and that's gonna bode really well. And then I, I said before we started this whole conversation, I'm getting, I'm getting like feelings of Claire Curzan and there's like, there's so many goofy little things about it. It's like date, like the, this new Dana Vollmer, it's sprint free, it's sprint fly, she's tall, she's blonde. She's really great at this young level and it's, it looks like it's not going to slow down. I mean, she's, there's just, I mean, the whole entire meet was, was a lot of fun to see some of our new and younger swimmers and Kate Douglas did Kate Douglas things on relays. I don't know if there's anybody more reliable uh, when it comes to the women's relays right now than her. So I've, I've done enough rambling. um, But no, I think it was, I'm very positive on the outlook for, for the world champs coming up here and then what we're going to see in 2024. So, yeah. And I think the one thing that I'll just add is something you mentioned before we record. And I just want to throw in there, Florian Welbrock breaking the 1500 meter short course record. Um, he certainly, I mean, he swam great at the Olympics. He I'm sure was disappointed to suffer from those um, Bobby Fink um, final fifties, you know? So um but, uh, you know, just looking at that swim and the Paltrinari record that he broke, you just beat him with better pacing. Um, so he's clearly, he's working on stuff. He's refining things. And um, that's, I think, what this type of meet is all about. I think the yeah. relays, for sure, I just think, like, it's got to be fun to swim relays at this meet. <laughs> like, uh, on some level, more, <laughs> yeah do those four by 50 relays, like, you know, for the kids that kids, they're no longer kids for the, the grownups who um, are not in college anymore. I'm sure it's like, yes, finally, I get to do a two medley relay (laughs) again. Um, And you can sort of see it in the level of performance. Some of these guys stepping up um, in these short relays. Canada had a great meet, you know, Maggie McNeil was on fire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then um, I can never pronounce her name right as well. Our, our Hong Kong. Um, Siobhan. Siobhan, yes. I, every time you tell me, I remember you saying it, but then I instantly forget at the moment that you say it. So she got a uh, Fina Swimmer of the Meat and yeah. tied that world record in a 200 free and 100 free and just firing on all cylinders. So Siobhan and Maggie McNeil are on the all irish name but don't don't swim for ireland team um anyway um as promised we've reached the end of the podcast and um so this is the part where i surprise eric Uh, we're gonna play a game and i'll tell you although let me just frame the game for everybody first um it seems like all anybody wants to talk about with regards to the sport of swimming go beyond the swimming nerds is Leah Thomas. Okay. And we have wrestled a number of times on this podcast with how we want to talk about Leah Thomas competing, um, in women's swimming and diving in the NCAA. Um, and for those of you who are expecting at the end of this intro that we're going to do that pretty much, no, we're not going to, I would never be that mean to Eric, but what I thought I would do is I have tortured myself for you, the listener, And I have sat down and read a Fox News article and a Swim Swam article about Leah Thomas. And I've scanned, I've not only done that, but I've scanned the comment section. And so what I'm about to do is I'm going to read two comments and I want Eric to guess which one is the Swim Swam comment and which one came from the Fox News comment section. (laughs) And just as a third addendum to this, I have screened these comments, you know, I've screened the most hateful, transphobic, horrible comments here. So if you're expecting some of the worst comments that you see on either site, I've made an effort to get rid of those um, again, because I 
don't think it's worth amplifying. Um, so here goes. And by the way, if you want to look for the articles I'm talking about, the Fox News article is actually Swimming World magazine editor comments on Leah Thomas. And then the Swim Swam article, these are comments from <laughs> Leah Thomas being on the Swim Swam podcast. Okay. So here's our first set. Here's our first comment. I grew up near a family of farmers. The girls were unbelievably strong and could beat the boys at anything that involved physical strength or speed. After the boys hit puberty, the advantage was gone. Okay, that's your first comment. Second comment, Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> which, one, which one was on Fox News and which one was on Swim Swam? I feel like the first one was on Fox News because it just, I mean, for, it just feels like it is. And the, the, the Fortnite comment is really indicative of any of the anonymous commenters that you've ever seen on Swim Slam when you get into the depths of it. Right. Some people just randomly say stuff. And those, the, the kind of Fortnite comment, I can't imagine would ever be on Fox News. You are correct, <laughs> Eric. The first comment about girls, strong girls on a farm was from Fox News. And the comment about Fortnite comes from Swim Swam. Okay, so you're one for one here. Or two for two. I don't know how we're scoring this. I didn't decide ahead of time. I guess if you guess one, you're going to get them all right. So, um, all right, here's the next set of comments. This is the beginning of women swimming downfall. Just imagine guys like Phelps or other male pro swimmer switching genders and compete as female, dot, dot, dot. Okay, that's your first comment. Second comment, they should take a knee if they see her on the line. May not be the most sportsmanship thing to do, comma, but, comma, <laughs> neither is this. The grammar on these comments is excellent. I'm going to leave you to guess which one is which. I'm saying, <clears throat> I'm saying the second one is Fox News because they said she's on the line, like on the starting line, like it's track. So they have right. no idea what's going on in swimming. That's right. my final answer. Right. And they don't understand the mechanics, too, of taking a knee at your, you, by the way, you're right. So once again, <laughs> yeah, I think the, 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 I feel like the take a knee is a dead giveaway that it's Fox news because, you know, that's like, they have to frame it in a, in a pre-existing debate um, and, and try to own the libs um, by saying something about taking a <laughs> knee. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and um, I guess, yeah, the other one, I don't know. I chose it because I thought they just mentioned Phelps. So I thought it could at least be a Fox News commenter who would know who Phelps was. Yeah, that would be I, the only yeah. swimmer. Yeah. Like that, that they've ever they heard had of. me going, but then you read the second one and then, <laughs> then you hear right on the line. And it's like, well, clearly we haven't had on the line in swimming since like the days of Gr ancient Greece. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's our last set. I don't know if I can even read these. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I've gathered myself. Women, if you voted for Biden and the Democrats, you brought this upon yourselves. Elections have consequences. <laughs> and just in case you thought that one couldn't be topped, here's the other one. This is the one all caps and only time that I wish John Leonard was back in the sport. There is no difference in this situation and the cheating that went down with the East Germans and Chinese women in the past Olympics. Eric, man, now these are too easy. But which one is the Fox News? It, it <laughs> is, but it's it's to the it's to the point where like it makes you second guess. Like yeah. somebody who happens to subscribe to both channels 
You could easily see the same person to... making both comments, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. for sure. So the the second one is clearly the John Leonard one is is I'm gonna have yeah. to go with swim swam, and um, it's really almost a. I would honestly, it was almost a, a coin flip because, I, like you said, I feel like that person made this would have made the same comment or maybe copy pasted it and just put it over the Fox News one, and then people would have had to try to Google search John Leonard. And yeah yeah and i think basically my comments are just i want to you know i said i wouldn't comment on any of this but then i lied as usual so um i don't think this is anything like east german or chinese doping those were intentional decisions to do something performance enhancing um with exogenous hormones right here we're talking about a person and the the crux of the debate around whether this is fair are actually uh, the person's own body's uh, ability to produce exogenous hormones and the benefits of puberty and all sorts of other very complicated things that I'm not going to get into um, in the course of this podcast. And then with regards to the Fox News comment, I don't remember Biden weighing in on whether Leah Thomas could compete in the NCAA, but I could be mistaken. That could have been part of Build Back Better was Leah Thomas can compete in, in women's swimming. Maybe. I, I don't know. I haven't read any of the legislation. So, but hey, uh, if you voted for Biden, this is your fault. OK, um, according at least according to um, the commenters on Fox News. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you for being game for that game. Thank you to everybody for listening. Um, we will not have a podcast for you next week, probably unless. Um, my children magically decide to be quiet for an hour while I'm in the house with them over the holidays. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but maybe, I, you know what? I have a day alone. Shh, don't tell anybody. Um, so maybe we'll get something for you next week, but don't, don't get your hopes up. Um, thank you to everybody for listening. Have a great holidays. Have a great Christmas. I know I'm a liberal, but I don't care about telling people who's who's honestly who's mad about hearing Merry Christmas. Do you know anybody that's mad when you tell them Merry Christmas? No, I haven't had anybody. I've never met that offended. person in person. Yeah. 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 So I like to mix so. it up. Happy holidays. Merry <laughs> Christmas. Sometimes I go Merry holidays and happy Christmas. Um, yeah. And it's not to not to discriminate against any other. Yeah. holidays that are in, are in December. Um, mm -hmm. I just need to diversify, diversify my understanding of all the holidays. And well, Hanukkah started in November this year. So Hanukkah was yes. like, was, has been long done. Um, yes. But anyway, not to wade into another political debate, but I did uh, anyway, because I can't help myself. <laughs> Thanks everybody for listening. Happy, and, uh, I'll just start, I'll just start telling everybody that I see out in public, happy winter training. Happy, happy training. And they'll totally training. understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Happy winter training. Trip. Happy hell week. Let's and, get into that one on the next one, huh? And, let's get into hell week conversations. No. <laughs> and thanks, Joe Biden.